I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. For I sought the Lord and he heard me. And he delivered me of all of my fears. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. His mercy endureth forever and his truth endureth to all generations. Come on, if you know your God is a good God, will you help me praise him tonight? From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, our God is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. We honor God. We honor the spirit of God tonight. Would that you would help me to applaud, appreciate, and celebrate the pastor of this people and the angel of this assembly, my friend, my fret brother, amen. The miracle himself. Amen. Dr. Michael Waldron. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Such an honor, such an honor to be able to stand before you tonight to declare that there's a word from the Lord. Certainly, uh, we honor First Lady as well, Dr. Waldron, the executive pastor. Amen. We certainly appreciate her. And to all of you, my dear father's children, it is indeed a joy and a privilege to be able to share that there is a word from the Lord. Go with me in your Bibles tonight to the book of Ruth, the book of Ruth, chapter 1. Ruth chapter 1, beginning at verse 6. Amen. Ruth chapter 1. Pastor Waldron, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if it's me or if it's the podium, but I feel like I've gotten taller since last year. I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm just, I'm just saying. This, I don't go a lot of places. I got to stand like this and my hands are... You can barely see my head, and I got to come to the side. And This is all right. This is all right. This is all right. Amen. Ruth chapter 1. Ruth chapter 1, beginning at verse 6. When you have it, let it be known by saying amen. amen. Reading from the New Living Translation tonight, Ruth chapter 1, beginning at verse 6. Scripture reads this way. Then Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah. By giving them good crops again. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave Moab to return to her homeland. With her two daughters-in-law, she set out from the, the, from the place where she had been living. And they took the road that would lead them back to Judah. But on the way, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back to your mother's homes. And may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. She then kissed them goodbye, and they all broke down and wept. No, they said, we want to go with you to your people. But Naomi replied, why should you go on with me? Can I still give birth to you to other sons who could grow up to be your husbands? No, my daughters, return to your parents' homes, for I am too old to marry again. And even if it were possible and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? Would you wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry someone else? No, of course not, my daughters. Things are far more bitter for me than for you because the Lord has raised his fist against me. And again, they wept together and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. Look, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. You should do the same. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. So the two of them continued on their journey. When they came to Bethlehem, the entire town was excited by their arrival. Is it really Naomi? The women asked. Don't call me Naomi, she responded. Instead, call me Mara, for the Almighty has made life very bitter for me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi? And the Lord has caused me to suffer, and the Almighty has sent such great tragedy upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, 
Accompanied by her daughter-in-law, Ruth, the Moabite woman, they arrived in Bethlehem in late spring at the beginning of the barley harvest. This is the word of the Lord. Might the people of God say amen. 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 You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to talk to the Holy Spirit's guidance and with your prayers tonight from the subject, keep it moving. Keep it moving. <clears throat> Listen, I'm an interactive preacher. That means I need your help to preach tonight. Do me a favor and nudge that neighbor beside you and tell them, neighbor. neighbor. Oh, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. Tell them sometimes, sometimes. The, best the best response you can have yeah. to what life throws your way is simply to keep it moving. Listen, grab a neighbor's hand tonight. Grab a neighbor's hand tonight. Let's go to God in prayer. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. We gather in these moments, in this time, this sacred space once again, to honor you for who you are, but also to worship you for what you have done. We're grateful for these moments that we have been given one more time, moments that were never promised and certainly moments that are not deserved. Yet your mercy meets us once again. We are grateful. Now, Lord, as we gather around your word, my prayer is that you let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart allow it to be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God, preach through me, to me, and for me. Send a word so your people will be edified, but in all things your name be glorified. I bless you for the treasure that you've placed in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Punish not your people now for the frailty and fragility of your preacher. Allow me to say it the way you want it said. Lord, you know my power is not enough. I need yours. My strength is insufficient. I am woefully inept for this moment. I need you. Have your way. Do what only you can do and say what only you can say. And we will be careful to give you the glory, the honor, and the credit. God, I pray now for the neighbor whose hand I hold tonight. I don't know what they've had to overcome to get here. I don't know what they've got to face when they leave. But God, I do know that you are a keeper. And the evidence that you're a keeper is that blood is still coursing warm through their veins. Every once in a while, we'll hear a bump. That's their heartbeat reminding them that you've given them life, health, and strength one more time. So Lord, if they're still alive, it means your plan is not over. So God, I pray that you'll use tonight, this moment, this, this hour of fellowship and worship as a reminder for my neighbor that whatever it is they stand in need of, God has not forgotten them. That God is still on their side. And Lord, when you come through for my neighbor, I will not get jealous. I will not be a hater. I will not have an attitude because you bless them. For Lord, we've discovered there's no secret what God can do. What you've done for others, you can do for us as well. And Lord, if you're blessing my neighbor, it means you're in the neighborhood. It won't be long before you come and see about me. So Lord, move. Be with us. Have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, if you know God answers prayer, give him a prayer answering praise in the house tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Beloved, every change in seasons requires you and I to learn something. Every time we are moved and shifted from one season to another, it requires that we learn something. But I've discovered that while we have to learn something every time a season changes, the hardest seasonal shifts are not when we have to learn something, but the hardest seasonal shifts are when we have to lose something. And if we're honest tonight, nothing shakes us quite like loss. See, loss changes everything. Nothing is ever the way you used to know it after loss. 
In fact, if we're honest, this is why many of us have a problem with seasons changing in our lives. See, most of us know things must change. We know that change is a normal and actually healthy part of life. But the part about change that rocks our worlds is what we often have to lose in the process of that change. So ultimately, we don't fear change. We fear loss. And each time we have to experience loss at any level, we subconsciously train ourselves to hold tightly to whatever it is that is about to go because our goal is that once we've experienced loss to never ever have to experience that kind of pain, hurt, and devastation again. So, 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 so whenever we feel like loss is coming again, whether it's something or somebody, we hold tightly as we possibly can to it, thinking that if we grasp it tight enough, if we pray hard enough, if we shout and dance loud enough, if we sow a big enough seed, if we come to church consecutively for enough months, loss will not have to be our portion again. But y'all, there, there, there's some, there's some, y'all don't mind if I call you y'all, I'm from Nashville, y'all, 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 y'all there's, some, there's some distinct truths that you and I have to embrace about loss if we're going to survive in this world. First thing you got to understand is loss is inevitable. You cannot avoid loss. See, see loss, loss knows where you live, even though you have not listed your address. Loss knows your phone number, even though it's private and undetected. Loss knows how to find you. Loss will drive into your uh, tenement apartment or loss will show up in your subdivision and catch you in the cul-de-sac. Loss knows how to find you. We live in a temporal world, but we like to think that we exercise eternal control. But the best we can ever have with anything in this life, the best relationship is temporary custody. The best relationship you can have with anything in this world and in this life is temporary custody. Family and friends, they're nice to have. They're wonderful. They can be soothing. They, they can provide a, a, a shoulder to cry on and an ear to listen. But everybody's going to have to let go of some family and some friends. And the best relationship you can have with them is temporary custody custody. So please don't build the entire existence of your life on a relationship that you have. Because light loss will take place and you will now have to discover what your identity is outside of that relationship. Health and strength. I know some of you, some of you are enjoying the boisterous, boisterous and joyous years of your 20s and some of you are in your 30s. But others of us have lived a little bit past that and we used to jump out of bed every morning. We couldn't wait until the sun came across the horizon to let us know it was another day. But now we got to sit on the bed and think about that thing for a minute. Got, got, got to make sure everything wakes up. See, everything doesn't wake up at the same time. It comes in seasons and waves. And I, I, I know you're enjoying health and strength today, but please don't build your entire existence upon your health, your strength, your energy, and how you feel today because the best relationship you can have with even health and strength is temporary custody. Jobs, career suits, oh, they're nice to go after. It's nice to have a goal in front of you that you can aim at and continually shoot for. But please don't build your identity and your, your 
absolute existence based upon what you drive, where you go to work, and where you live. Because life can throw you a set of uh, uh, circumstances that can shift and change what it is you thought was always going to be permanent. And when jobs shift and career pursuits change and pink slips come to visit you and downsizing and unemployment becomes your everyday existence, please don't have your life built upon what you used to have and where you used to stay because the best relationship you can have with that stuff is temporary custody wealth and material possessions oh it's nice to to ball it's nice to look good it's nice to have it all together but please don't let custom let culture and society define you based upon how they view you because the best relationship you'll have with it is temporary custody fame and popularity temporary custody meaningful experiences temporary custody access to special places temporary custody beloved loss is a fact of life and when loss shows up it ain't just something you get over quickly it's not something you quickly shake off and act like it never happened because wherever loss shows up her twin sister grief will also show up whenever you deal with loss grief finds its way, walks into the meanderings, in, the meanderings of your life and adjusts your schedule and your itinerary to make you deal with her presence. I know, I know, I know we're in church tonight. And often in church spaces, we're taught that if our faith was really strong, we would be over it by now. If our faith was strong, if we really loved the Lord, that, 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 that we would have gotten past this by now. But let me help you. Please be careful trying to please pseudo-spiritual people who don't really understand the connection between loss and grief. When you lose something, and especially when you lose somebody, grief comes, visits you, and it does not tell you how long it's going to stay. And if you try to kick grief out too fast, you'll discover that in a few days she'll come back and she stays longer on the second visit than she did on the first. I get so tired, I get so tired of pseudo-spiritual saints who want to tell people that after who've dealt with loss that you're supposed to get over it quickly and you can't tell God how you feel and you ought to, you ought to pick your own self up by your own bootstraps. Can I tell you something? God understands your loss. God understands your grief. And God is not so insecure in his divinity that he can't handle the questions of humanity. He doesn't have a problem with you taking your time dealing with it. Loss is inevitable. You cannot avoid it. For us, loss is trouble. For us, loss is trying. For us, loss is a trial. But for God, I've discovered that loss can actually be a tool. See, see, see th th this, is, this is when you're in a season of loss and you're dealing with a season like this. You have to let God lead you in seasons where you've got to deal with loss because you will quickly discover that if you let God lead you through a season of loss, you will discover there is no season of your life that God's power cannot be seen. There is no moment that you'll ever walk yourself through that God's power, presence, and preeminence cannot be manifested in the middle of wherever you might be. That's why wherever loss threatens to stop us, God can use loss to shift us. I said it too fast. I'll say it again. I, I, I said often we think loss has come to stop us, but if we let God lead us, we will discover that what has come to stop us, God can use it to shift us. This is, y'all, the genius of God, that even loss can have redemptive possibilities for our journey when we let God lead us. Why, you might ask? Because God never merely changes our seasons from something. He actually is shifting us to something. 
I, I, I need you to get that. That's fundamental to understand. If, if you understand that losses are not just meant to test you and to try you, but they're actually seasons wherein God wants to pull you from some place and take you to another place, loss can turn out to be redemptive in your life. So then the loss we experience might actually be an invitation to find out what God actually has next. I said that too fast one more time. I said this is how you don't lose your mind in a season of loss. When you know that God still knows the end at the beginning. When you know that God is still the first, the last, and he is everlasting to everlasting. When you still know that all things are still working together for the good of them that love the Lord who are called according to his purpose, then even when loss shows up, you begin to look at God and say, God, this doesn't feel good right here. I'm hurting right long through here right now this doesn't make a lot of sense to me but if you got me to it I know you can take me through it and whenever he moves and shifts us from something he's taking us to something so the key to handling the season of loss is to keep moving towards what God has next that's all I came to tell you tonight that, 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 that whatever season of loss you might be dealing with God is not finished with you. God is not done with you. In fact, you are in the middle of a sovereign providential plan, a strategy that God set up even before the foundation of the world. And even when you can't see God, God can still see you. Even when you don't know where you are, how you're going to get out, what's going to happen next, God is still faithful and he will take care of his own. Some of you don't believe me. I'm glad. I brought some evidence. In the book of Ruth, we, 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 we get introduced to this, to, this, to this bad sister by the name of Ruth. But, but, but Ruth, is, Ruth is a wonderful book you've got to read in your own time. But chapter 1 is for our consideration tonight. And in chapter 1, we don't meet Ruth first. We actually meet a brother by the name of Elimelech. And Elimelech is married to his wife, Naomi. They have two sons by the, name of, the names of Malon and Kilion. And they escape famine in Judah by moving to Moab. Life was good in Judah until famine struck. Life was good until the season changed. And so they get up and they go to Moab, and in Moab, things are much better. They got good government jobs in Moab. They, 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 live, they live in a nice house in Moab. Sons end up getting married as well to two daughters-in-law by the name of Orpah and Ruth. Life is good in Moab until life changes again. Bible says that Elimelech dies and Naomi is now a widow. All she has left are her two sons and her two daughters in law. Sometimes when you think you've hit the bottom, you discover the bottom has a basement. And the Bible says Elimelech dies, but then Malon and Kilion die too. Now there's Naomi, there's Ruth, there's Oprah. And these three sisters have to figure out what life is going to look like after their loss. I want to apologize to you tonight. Because too often in Christian circles, we have turned the story of Ruth into a love story with Boaz as the leading character. I want to apologize to you tonight because this ain't the book of Boaz. This is the book of Ruth. And by making Boaz the star, we often miss the lessons that these sisters provide. Now, now, now maybe this tendency speaks to our need to have a male provider in order to celebrate female presence. I don't have time to dive into that tonight. All I came to tell you is that the real story of Ruth is about how a Moabite sister overcomes patriarchy, pain, loss, and grief to start her life over and with the wisdom and the nuanced perspective of her sagaciously savvy mother-in-law, she walks into a new season of productivity and power and it all started because after a season of loss she kept it moving 
That's all I came to tell you tonight. That it doesn't matter where you've come from. God still has a place he wants to take you to. It doesn't matter where you sit in the season of your life that God still has plans for you and they are plans to bring you a future and a hope and an expected end. And even though you walk through loss, doesn't mean you got to get lost. God has power that if you'll keep moving, he'll get you to where he wants you to be. Are y'all interested tonight? Here, here, here it is. Here it is. How, how in the world then, how in the world then do, do, do I make sure I keep it moving. Here, here it is. Number one, if I'm going to keep it moving, I've got to learn to make some critical decisions. I've got to make some critical choices. See, see, see before, before we can ever get to where we're going, we first have to make some decisions about where we are. Walk with me through the text for a moment. I, I want to introduce you and give you a quick curriculum vitae, if you will, of these three sisters. The, we, the first sister we meet is a sister by the name of Naomi. Naomi is widowed. She lost both of her sons and she has two daughters-in-law remaining. But Naomi decides, makes a choice, makes a decision to do something from this space. Verse 6, Bible says she decides to leave Moab and to return to Judah, her homeland. She does it because good crops have come again and she sees better life there in Judah. Wait a minute, there's another sister. Another sister by the name of Ruth. And Ruth is now widowed and she has no sons. She lost her husband and they did not have any sons. Verse 16, verse 17 she makes a decision. Ruth decides that wherever Naomi goes, that's where I'm going. Naomi makes an attempt to talk her out of going with her and tells her go back to what is comfortable and go back to what makes sense for you and Ruth says, nah, that's probably not what I'm going to do. I'm hanging out with you. Wherever you go, that's where I'm going. Wherever you stay, that's where I'm going to stay. That's the second sister. But wait a minute. There's a third sister in the passage by the name of Orpah. Now, Orpah is also widowed. She lost her husband, but they did not have children either. She's got no sons or daughters. Verse 14 says she makes a decision. She decides to leave Naomi and to leave Ruth and to return to her homeland in Moab. Watch this. Each of these women made the decision they believed was best for the season they were in. They have all experienced tremendous loss and they are living with that loss. They all decide to move forward in their lives, but they don't all do it the same way. Naomi and Ruth are going back to Judah together, but Orpah decides to return to her homeland in Moab. Listen, never. Do we hear Naomi or Ruth demonize Opa for making a choice that was different than theirs? We also never hear Opa disparaging the choices of Naomi and Ruth. They each do what they believe their season requires. Can I pull you up to the window real quick? Because too often, too often, we allow what others have to say about the season that we're in to impact the decisions we make about the seasons we got to navigate through. Please let me tell you, be very, very careful about allowing others to live vicariously through you and let others who've never worn your shoes tell you how they ought to fit. At the end of the day, you are the one that's got to live with the consequences. You are the one that's got to bear and carry the fruit of the seeds you've sown, you better make the decision for yourself. Wait a minute. That's one side. Here's the other side. On the other side, if we're not allowing other people to bother us about the choices we make, often we want to criticize. I lost a third of y'all right there. We, we want to we won't criticize and offer commentary on the decisions that other people have to make about the season they're in. Y'all know how we do it. Girl, if I were you, bruh, if I had your hand, you know how we do. We, 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 we're, we're trying to get other people to see life from where we sit when in reality, that's not the seat they currently occupy. They're in a different space. They're in a different season. They've got different motivations. They've got different 
our reactions they've got to respond to. They've got different history. They've got different options. And so they have to make the decision that's best for them. Please be very, very careful evaluating the decisions of someone else in a season you have never, ever been in. If it's not your season, you can't tell me how to get through it. They've got to make decisions. You've got to make decisions and let God lead you the way through. You're going to keep it going. You're going to keep it moving. You can't live off grandmama's testimony. If you're going to keep it moving, you can't let mama and them tell you how to function in the season you're in. You got to make some decisions for your, y'all getting it, for yourself. Keep it moving. I got I to I I I make some critical decisions. But, 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 but here's, here's the second thing. Uh, if I'm going to keep it moving, I also have to learn how to manage the changing definitions. See, uh, when seasons change, they often call for us to redefine who we are. Ooh, that's scary. That's, that's, that, that's, that's the frightening part of changing seasons that I no longer get to look through the lens that I used to look through. And because the lens has changed, the view has changed. And that is frightening for many of us because we never had to look at life any differently than the season we just left. You think I'm making it up. Watch the text. Naomi is a widow. Ruth is a widow. They are both widows in a time when their values were determined by the men in their lives. You know, if you paid attention to Hebrew history and, 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 and in Israelite custom, you, 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 you will quickly discover that during this time, uh, 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 women could not even own property. In fact, they were considered to be property. If the husband died and there were no sons to carry on. They would go through a practice called the kinsman redeemer wherein the next closest relative would be, would be obligated to marry that widow to make sure that the lineage of the family continued. These sisters got no husband, got no sons. Their lives have been based upon the presence of men in their lives. And now they have neither. What in the ham sandwich, are they gonna do? This, this, this new identity is foreign to them, but it also provides a certain level of freedom. I mean, I mean, I mean, for the first time, they now get to decide where, when, how they wanna go. For the first time, perhaps ever, they get a chance to discover what lies before them. For the first time, perhaps ever, they get a shot to engage in life from a different perspective. See, see, seasonal changes that make us experience loss force us to redefine what life means. This is, this is why we often would rather stay in the last season. Because now I have to make choices that I'm not used to making. They are frightening. They are scary. And I have to look at life in a way I've never seen it before. This is why you can't allow what the world labels you to dictate who you are. Because if I make my identity based upon the season I'm in, when the season changes... I no longer know who I am. And when I don't know who I am, the prospect of becoming somebody different is frightening. It is earth shattering to the point where I'll stay in a season I know I ain't supposed to be in no more. Just so I can be comfortable with the identity that I used to wear. Preach, Pastor Face It. I, don't worry about it. I can help myself. It's all right. Some of you are in relationships you knew you should have ended seasons ago. 
but because you'd rather be miserable than to be alone. You stay in a tainted and toxic place. This thing on? Oh, I, I know you're here. you in every city across the country. We'd rather be, 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 be miserable because it's comfortable than to be free because that's too scary. Here's what we got to know. When law shows up, and your definitions change. Just because your definition changes does not mean your destiny changes. God has not changed his mind about who you are. God has not shifted or altered his strategy concerning your life and your purpose. You are still who God says you are. There's still greatness in front of you. There's still purpose and a plan for your life. But it might require you to see it in a way you've never seen it before. You, you, are, you are more than how people identify you. you you're, you're more than the title that even your family has placed upon you. you, you you're, you're more than what the world, the nomenclature they've set and stamped on you and it might be time for you to discover what else lies in you that you could not see before you lost what you thought you had to have Ooh, who am I talking to tonight mm. you are mourning the loss but the loss was actually your declaration of independence it was the very thing you needed to become who God had destined and designed for you to be in the first place. And while you are mourning what you lost, it's actually the best thing that ever happened to you. I wish I could find a witness here tonight that could testify. You know what? When I lost what I thought I had to hold on to, I thought I was going to lose my mind. I had pills in my hand. I thought about it. I had a gun in my hand. I thought about it. I was on the bridge and I thought about it. But God walked me through the season of loss only to help me discover that the best me was on the other side of the loss I had to experience. And if I had lost it, I wouldn't know me, but I also wouldn't know God. God. If I had lost it, I wouldn't know God the way I know God. You, 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 you got to manage changing definitions. I'm, I'm almost done. Here it is. Um, you're going to keep it moving. You got to manage to change definitions, but, 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 but then watch. You got to move toward continued development. Somebody say keep it moving. Let me help you here. The greatest temptation in a season of loss is to shut down. The greatest temptation when you got to lose something that you have connected to your entire journey and existence. The greatest temptation is to shut down and to check out on life. Problem is, if you shut down, not only will you experience loss, you'll get lost. Find yourself in a fetal position on the bathroom, not even knowing who you are. Find yourself pondering pensively through a windshield, trying to figure out, God, what's next. You'll find yourself in places that you never should have been because you checked out when stuff got crazy. You can live through a loss if you don't get lost. You can live through a season of absence, lack, and deficiency if you don't allow it to define who you are. Here, here, here it is. Here it is. How, how, how do you do that? You keep it moving. And, and, and not just moving. Because I can be moving. And three years later, five years later, ten years later, in the same spot I 
was when the loss happened. I, 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 can't, I can't just be moving. I got to engage in movement. It means I got to find something that's worth my energy, find something that's worth my time and put my effort towards that. When I can't find enough in me to keep going, I find some outside of me and I push myself towards that. Okay, y'all, 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 y'all think I made it up. Naomi and Ruth head to Judah. They're leaving Moab. They are grieving and dealing with a real loss. They got attitudes, and they got a right to have attitudes. They're mad. They probably cussing on the way. They're upset. They're bothered. They they, they, they are grieving, but they are grieving on the go. They, they they, they 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 are mourning. Their hearts are broken, but they are mourning on the move. They are cussing the whole way. But while they cussing, they stay on course. They are struggling. They, 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 are, they are highly upset with God and with their circumstance, but they keep putting one foot in front of the other. Matter of fact, Naomi got such an attitude, she changed her name. Bible says she gets back to Judah and it's her 20th uh, high school reunion and everybody said, oh, there go Naomi. She said, don't call me Naomi. My name is Mara. Mara means bitterness. It means the Lord has been bitter and, and unkind to me. She's got an attitude, but she stays active. Can I tell you that's where God wants you? That even if you're mad, even if you're struggling, even if you got tears in your eyes, even if your heart is broken and your mind is confused and you got more questions than answers, God still wants you to keep moving. Because God says this, if I can trust you to keep moving, then I can get you to where I need you to be. If I can trust you to keep going, even if you got to go on autopilot for a few days and a few months, I'll drive. You just make sure you stay in the car. I'm almost done. Here it is. Here it is. If, 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 if I'm going to keep moving, I got to move toward continued development. What will happen if you keep moving? Here's what you'll discover. You'll end up meeting those who have a connected destiny. Too fast. If, if while I'm upset, while I got a problem, I keep moving, I will end up meeting those along the way whose destiny is connected to mine. I just told you, when God takes you from something, he always brings you to Good class. He brings you to something. Text says, Naomi and Ruth leave Moab, and they return to Judah. But I need you to know, the journey from Moab to Judah is not a simple journey. Not only is it tough psychologically and tough emotionally, spiritually as well, but geographically, it's a challenging journey. Because in order for them to get from Moab to Judah, first thing they got to do is they got to go around the Dead Sea. After they get around the Dead Sea, now they've got to navigate their way through and over the Jordan River. While they are going around and navigating through, they are upset, they are attitudinal, they are emotional. They're also traveling on a, on a pathway that is filled with antagonists, predators, and robbers who are looking to stop and prey on them as they go. Moab, Judah, they got to go around the Dead Sea. They got to go over the Jordan River. They got to wrestle with predators They got to deal with adversaries. They got to deal with weather. And regardless of how long the travel, 
Bible says they arrive during the time of the barley harvest. Too fast. I know. I know. Too, too, too fast. Too fast. They left Moab. They went around the Dead Sea, through the Jordan River, wrestled with weather and time, dealt with adversity, dealt with predators, and they arrived at the time of the barley harvest. The day they arrived at the time of the barley harvest, you'll discover in another chapter, Boaz, the owner of the field that they show up to that day, happens to be present at their arrival. If they mourn in Moab one day too long, they miss the connection to meet the one who was tied to their future and their purpose. Now, now I told you this ain't the book of Boaz. It's the book of Ruth. Do you think Ruth was the first sister that caught Boaz's attention? At the field? Promise you it wasn't. Guarantee you. Wasn't the first sister. Called his attention. But then none of them. Make scripture. Boaz. And Ruth. Made scripture. So maybe then. The catch. Ain't Boaz. Maybe the catch is the one who even while mourning went around the Dead Sea, through the Jordan River, dealt with all the adversity and the opposition and still made it to their due season. Why is it so important that Ruth gets there to Boaz? Here's why. Bible tells us Ruth marries Boaz. Ruth and Boaz have a baby by the name of Obed. Obed grows up, has a son by the name of Jesse. Jesse grows up has a boy by the name of David. David becomes the first line through which 40 and two generations later would give birth to a baby boy in Bethlehem by the name of Jesus. This is a word for somebody tonight. Because you've been told that if you quit where you are, that it only affects and, and deals with you. But what you don't know is uh, that what God has for you is greater than the generation that you're in right now. And if you stop in the season that you're in right now, God will uh, make sure that that purpose doesn't go where it needs to go. All I came to tell somebody tonight is, don't let what you see make you stop believing what God has said about you. There might be some seasons when you've got to deal with loss. There might be some times when you've got to deal with difficulty. But I came tonight to let somebody know that you can't quit where you are because the next generation is depending on you to live out your purpose. The next generation is waiting on you to do what you've been called to do so they can yes, do what they've been called to do. Creation is waiting for the manifestation of the son and the daughters of God 
out to be who you've been called to be. So don't let your loss and let your difficult season make you quit on what God says. If God brought you to it, he will, yes, bring you through it. I got to get out of here. But is there anybody in the building tonight that can testify? I made it through the last loss and he'll take me through the next one too. God will make sure I've got everything that I need. So I feel my Baptist kicking in. I hope you don't mind tonight. Be not dismayed. Whatever be tight. For God will take care of you beneath his wings of love abide. God will take care of you. I got one more question. Is there anybody that knows it? Is there anybody ever lived it? Anybody ever walked through it? If you know he can, open up your mouth and lift your hands and give your God an overcomer's praise. I will make it through. I will overcome. I will transform in the name of Jesus. If you know it's going to happen, bless him in the house if you know it will take place give him the glory give him the praise say yes yes say yes